Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's video. This is going to be a follow-up actually to my previous video, which is all discussing the Hellraiser reboot movie, remake movie that's going to be appearing on Hulu. This actually is with Clive Barker attached, uh, uh, Bruckner as well, uh, who did the Night House, uh, but he also did uh, the Fantastic Ritual. He's done some some you know decent things along the way, um, whether you appreciate the Night House or not. So this is a reboot movie. I did I did a previous video on this. This it went for test screenings. Here's the leaks from the test screenings, basically. Now, just with respect to all of that, I think it's really important to note that uh, this is not independently verified at this point in time. I just don't I, you know I, I can't get any more information. I'm afraid it long been known that this is going to go for test screenings. I know that that has gone for test screenings as a fact. I've seen plenty of evidence to indicate uh, that is entirely legitimate. What I cannot confirm, though, is that this plot is going to be 100% accurate. I just can't confirm that. I've not had enough uh, time to confirm. I did think that there would be between these videos, but there's not. So if you missed the first video, I'll leave it linked above. But let's dive into this. This is going to fill in the blanks. So, more information. Okay, there were multiple Cenobites seen in this film, aside from Pinhead and the updated version of Chatterer. So these are, you know, these are the stars of the show, as it were. The Cenobites are always the stars. They should be seen little and often, um, little bits here and there, just the tease, you know, a little bit of a cock tease for everyone. Uh, but we should see them. It should be a good display. It's where whoever's writing and directing this can really show up their, you know, fucked up nature um, and really dive into it. So we've got some information on that. There was a female who has a top of her skull exposed like Angelique in Hellraiser Bloodline. Cool. Like the sound of that. It was always a good look for Angelique. Um, you know, it, it, it was an interesting one. Um, because the actress that they had who played Angelique was a, was a beautiful woman. Very, 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 very attractive woman. Um... And what the Cenobites represent in, you know, in their sort of image and things like that, it should be showing that sort of polarization of sexuality as well as the grotesqueness. And they did that very well with Angelique. So if they get a, you know, another actress that is equally as attractive uh, and rip the top of her skull open like that, yeah, like you, you play off against that quite nicely again. So the skin from her scalp is connected to this sort of crescent-shaped framework protruding from her shoulders. So that sounds very Tortured Souls-esque, which I like the sound of that. Uh, and that would rise up on both sides of her head. So it was kind of pulled back and drawn up like that. She had uh, the most dialogue in the film, apparently, aside from Pinhead, which is interesting. Uh, I like that. I like the sound of that. Because um, Pinhead's this sort of, you know, noble-esque character, obviously played by Jamie Clayton now. Uh, but this sort of Angelique-esque uh, you know, Beauty and the Beast kind of character having another, you know, few lines of dialogue more. Good. But then also as well, the crescent-shaped framework is very similar to the female Cenobite, a.k.a. Deep Throat, uh, in 1 and 2, who also had a very similar, you know, they had the other amount of dialogue to Pinhead. So it's kind of playing off that a little bit, like a nice throwback, I think. Now, this individual said that the creepiest Cenobite, in their opinion, is one that appears to be in a constant state of asphyxiation, with the skin of its face stretched back over its entire head. Mouth visible underneath the flesh, wheezing and gasping. So that's, yeah, I mean, that plays on that asphyxiation sort of nightmare that people have. Uh, we see the exposed back of this creature, showing us the spine and a view of its lungs, struggling to expand with each breath. There's also one Cenobite brief, briefly seen that has only the skin of its face stretched out with wires. So there's no actual skull or head upon its shoulders. So it's just a framework of wires. Um, interesting, really gross. Uh, yet the lips moved and it could still speak. Love the sound of that. And that's actually a play on you know Frank being completely ripped apart but still being able to talk. Uh, as well as Pinhead's face appearing on the well the sort of pillar of souls uh, it's very interesting kind of way they're sort of throwing it back to these things i think personally anyway now here's where we start to talk about the puzzle box a little bit so the puzzle box actually changes into various symmetrical shapes throughout the movie there's going to be each configuration having its own unique name 
So the two that this individual can recall were Lament and Liminal. So each successful configuration gets the user closer to Leviathan. But a soul must be claimed as a result. So essentially, you must continue feeding the box to unlock what is essentially the final prize, which is granted upon the user by the god Leviathan. Now, they use a temporary score, uh, and that was themes from Christopher Young's Hellraiser soundtrack, and something similar to House on Haunted Hill. So, yeah. That's quite interesting stuff, I think, personally. Now, just to sort of explain a bit further this sort of, you know, box movement, Cenobites, etc. The story is essentially about a young woman named Riley trying to rescue her brother from hell. We meet her at the start of the film as someone with a history of alcohol and drug addiction, currently living with her older brother in an apartment near the city. Uh, I believe this portion of the film is supposed to take place in Massachusetts, which is kind of a... Th that, that's off kilter because the first one was supposed to be set in England, actually. Um, so they've kind of thrown that out the window, but never mind. Um, but this individual is not entirely certain. Their relationship, so Riley and her brother, is on shaky ground due to Riley's inability to sort out her own life. The brother has to cover her financially and has to keep her on the straight and narrow when it comes to her sobriety. Meanwhile, Riley's boyfriend entices her with a proposition to make some quick cash by stealing from an eccentric rich guy named Voigt, played by Goran Viznij. Viz, 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 I'm butchering that. Goran, uh, who has property stored at an abandoned warehouse. So they go inside this abandoned warehouse. There's a giant storage container. They find a single safe. They crack open the safe and they reveal the puzzle box. Now, obviously, they're disappointed by this. Uh, they didn't score any cash or anything perceived as valuable. Riley then takes the box home. She gets into a fight with her brother that same night and runs off with the box. She begins playing around with this box and it begins to change form. Now the Cenobites are su uh, summoned briefly in flashes. They announce that they have come for her but will take another in her place as she has not finished solving the puzzle which must be manipulated into multiple configurations before its final form is achieved and an audience can be granted with Leviathan. They choose her brother instead. So obviously her end prize will obviously be give me my brother back, I'm sure. I like that. I like the changes to the sort of mythos. I think that's interesting. Uh, and it's an expansion of what we'd seen already, I think, personally. Some will disagree, but I think we have seen these many different variations of the puzzle box. We didn't learn that it did anything, but why not have it do something? I think that's interesting. Now, this begins Riley's journey to discover the mis mysteries of the box while trying to keep the people around her alive. The box this time around has its own set of rules, and it needs a fresh soul each time it is solved into a new configuration. This is how the Cenobites are summoned and how the film keeps the victims plentiful. So lots and lots of gore. There are plenty of Cenobites seen throughout the film, including a reimagined version of Chatterer. They are appropriately disturbing and scary. One thing that this individual did love about the movie was the way the Cenobites appear to a victim. The immediate environment around a person who is marked begins to transform like a puzzle with chunks of concrete walls, floors, and even the inside of a vehicle twisting and moving like pieces of a puzzle breaking away until the Cenobites reveal themselves. Overall, they enjoyed the film, and after years of terrible sequels of lousy writing and bad acting, this individual says, uh, it was a bit surprising to see a version with some real money behind it, with a genuinely good cast. It, it isn't perfect, they, they indicate, uh, but it is actually well made and definitely frightening. So there you go. What do you think? I personally like the sound of this, actually, believe it or not. Um... I, you know, and I, I, I like to think I'm one of Hellraiser's biggest critics, you know. I'm happy to just rag on it here and there as much as love on it as well. So let me know what you guys think down below. If you're new here, do hit subscribe. Cheers, ladies and gents. Take care.